The following message is by Pastor John Piper. More information from Desiring God is available at www.desiringgod.org. Sometimes I write a star article to support a sermon that I just preached, and rarely, but today, I preach a sermon to support a star article that I just wrote, namely the one entitled this week, Today's mercies for today's troubles, tomorrow's mercies for tomorrow's troubles. One of the points in that little newsletter article was that every day, day by day, God appoints just enough trouble for that day. No more and no less than he deems best. He whose heart is kind, not angry, kind, beyond all measure, gives unto each day what he deems best lovingly. It's part of pain and pleasure. Mingling toil with peace and rest. Now we we receive, and we don't always get real enthusiastic in agreement with his judgment about the measure of pain that he deems best. We get real upset sometimes because we are wired not to equate pain and kindness. Why should I think somebody is kind if they've caused me pain? But the psalm writer knows well. He whose heart is kind beyond all measure gives unto each day its part of pain and pleasure. We'll see another hymn when we're done here uh, that says by another hymn writer, totally Disconnected in another country and in another era with another metaphor saying almost exactly the same thing. It's what hymn writers tend to say all the time. Every day, by a sovereign God, there is appointed pain and pleasure. That was one of the first points of the article. A second point was this. Every day with that specifically appointed, divinely ordained measure of pain and pleasure, there is a new, fresh, specifically ordained and divinely designed measure of fresh, sustaining mercy carried. Every day. But we are... We're the kind of people, comes with finitude and it comes with sin, who want today to experience the resources that are only going to be given tomorrow for tomorrow's pain. We can see the pain coming, some of it, not all of it. Sometimes we see more than's coming. and Sometimes we see less than's coming. We're not good judges about what tomorrow will bring. But when we see enough, we want very badly right now to feel adequate for it. And and God doesn't set it up that way. Tomorrow. What about children? What about the children? Will my children believe tomorrow in ten years? Or will they swerve from the narrow way that leads to life and go into unrighteousness and destruction and eternal calamity? Parents care about tomorrow. What about our health? Will I go blind before I die? Will I go deaf? Will I get Alzheimer's and start to lose my memory and not be able to function? Will I outlive Noel and all my sons and all my friends who are my age and spend the last ten years of my life slumped over in a wheelchair in a rural nursing home in Easley, South Carolina, drooling until I just died? 
What about marriage? Will we ever trust each other again? Will we be happy? Will 30, 40, 50 years be frustration? Hitting your head against a wall because you can't ever seem to work it out? Will we be there for the children? Will we be there for each other? What about Bethlehem? What will tomorrow bring? What will Wednesday bring this week? What will Sunday bring? What will a decade bring? Will there be 2,000 by 2,000? Will there be white-hot worship for a decade of the glory of our great God of grace? Will there be the resting of our people under the loving care of 17 district elders? Will there be soul winning and family uniting and body healing and city transforming labors of ministry by 1,200 or 2,000 or 3,000 lay people? What will tomorrow bring? We care about tomorrow. What will it be like? And will we be wise for it? Will we be loving for it? Will we be adequate for it? Will we have the resources for it, the strength for it? What about tomorrow? And the point of the article was the strength to live it, to live tomorrow, will be given tomorrow, not today. Today... What we are asked to do is live in and on the mercy given for today's burdens. And that is all. One of those mercies given today to all God's children is the faith that more will be given tomorrow. Not that we will experience them now for tomorrow. But they will be there when tomorrow's burdens come. This is very important to me. I uh, I wrote the article because it was red hot in my front burner. I preached the sermon because as the elders were praying after the meeting on Wednesday night, whether I should preach and what I should preach. uh, And as we were praying, I felt and they confirmed this is it. This is the message again, even though I had written the star article. And it's so important to me. Because of the way I'm wired, and I think I'm just average on this score, I am wired to want very badly to feel the resources today for what I know what's coming tomorrow. I want to feel the resources today when I contemplate the pressures and problems of tomorrow. And that's not good because God doesn't do it that way. He hasn't set it up that way. That we feel the emotional, spiritual, physical resources for what we imagine is going to happen tomorrow. To want that is a very, very dangerous thing. Uh, it, It will result in one of two things, I think. One... If you try to live your life that way, needing, desperately needing to feel adequate today for tomorrow's challenges, you will go down. You'll you'll be crushed. Eventually you'll cave in. And tomorrow's burdens will become so heavy that under the, the mercies that are perfectly designed for today's burdens and are not designed for tomorrow's, you're going down. That's one possibility. The the other possibility is, this is real common in American culture because we have loads of books written on how to do it. You can find a worldly way to stoke your ego so that you actually do get enough ego strength to feel sufficient for tomorrow's pain and tomorrow's burden. And become a kind of macho person who is really in charge of the business and the church or or whatever else. So that you know you can pull it off. And generally people like that can. 
until, until it really comes. She dies, or a strange lump, or the job is suddenly not there anymore, or. But you can go that route. You can choose to go that route. You can read those number one books, you know, on how to stoke your engine and be in charge and make it happen. That's the way to handle this tremendous need that we all feel to be adequate today for tomorrow's pain and challenges. Now, those are not God's solutions. Those aren't God's way. God's alternative way for you to handle that rising sense of, I gotta, I gotta feel tonight that when I go to bed and it's on empty, I could do something before I go to sleep to get it up about a quarter of a tank. So at least I know when I get up in the morning, there'll be a quarter of a tank there. That's not the way God designed you to go to bed. He designed you, by and large, to go to bed on empty. What's the text? There are two texts in this message, two verses. And you don't need to look them up. Most of you know these by heart because we they're both in songs. The first one is uh, this last verse of Jesus' wonderful words about not being anxious in Matthew 6, verse 34 where it says, do not be anxious for tomorrow, for tomorrow will care for itself. And then this great sentence, each day has enough trouble of its own. Or like the old King James says, sufficient unto the day is the evil, the calamity thereof. Not today. That one will be sufficient. Now, let me just tell you what I think that doesn't mean before I tell you what I think it does mean. I don't think it means that you shouldn't make appropriate preparations and plans for something you've got to take care of tomorrow. Farmers know when the silos are low. You've got to plow and you've got to plant in May, so that you have corn in October. It's not sin to do that. In fact, I think I would say just about everything worth doing requires some forethought and planning. Jesus said, uh, which of you desiring to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost? Think about the future whether he has enough to complete it. So Matthew 6, 34. Don't be anxious about tomorrow. Tomorrow will be anxious of itself. Sufficient unto that day is the evil thereof. Don't bring it into today. That doesn't mean don't think about that day at all. Well, what does it mean? What does this word enough or sufficient mean? Sufficient unto the day is the evil Thereof, or each day has enough trouble of its own. Enough. What's enough? <laughs> Who decides what's enough? Well, that great old Swedish Christian made a decision about how he or she decided what was enough. Lovingly, its part of pain and pleasure is given by. He who deems best, namely our Father, who is kind beyond all measure. God decides what's enough. God looks at a day, and in his sovereign, overarching providence, he designs a day for every one of his children. And he watches and he designs the troubles mounting. And some days, as it mounts like this, he says, enough. And other days it mounts like this and he says, enough. But he always says enough. He says enough. And he says it. And it happens. It's just enough. This, this morning I was, I was reading in the Greek Testament just to make sure that one of my favorite sentences on this score was exactly what I thought to be in the English. Namely, he will not permit you to be tested. Huper, beyond what you are able. 
God's in charge of how much comes. The word for temptation and testing is the same in Greek. Sometimes the temptation comes from evil. Sometimes it comes from good. Sometimes it's a sickness. Sometimes it's a, a dirty magazine. He will not suffer you to be tested beyond. There's enough. He watches it and he says, enough. So the enough of Matthew 6.34 is God's enough. He is the designer of our days. He will not allow a day to be filled with more pain, more trouble, more evil than he deems best. Now, you can know some of that that's coming tomorrow. You can make some preparations for it. But if you try to feel the resources to handle that tomorrow, today, if you try to ask all the questions of how it will go tomorrow, will there be rain in July? Will the sun be right? Will my loan come through? Will the tractor break down? And all the other questions you can ask about your particular issue, you will go under. Make your plan is faithful. Try to figure it all out and feel the resources for it today is not faithful. It's lacking in trust. Today's mercy includes the mercy of faith that when you don't feel it today, you will have it tomorrow. Let me give you an example. The staff has to plan worship services for a while now. It's like farming. If you're going to have a harvest on Sunday, if there's going to be a gathering, a unified offering up to the Lord, uh, on Sunday, somebody's got to plow and sow and water on Wednesday, Thursday. And that's good. Jesus calls us to that. But what what if in the heart that's doing that work, you start to say, well, will anybody be there? Or what if it doesn't flow? Or what if they don't like it? Or will God come down? Will there be power? Will there be authenticity? Will it be deep? Will it be real? And the questions just roll. And you have crossed. I have crossed from faithful preparation into faithless anxiety. That's not Wednesday's burden. It's not Wednesday's burden. Whether there's an anointing on me to preach on any given hour is not Wednesday's burden. Whether anybody shows up is not Wednesday's burden. It's a dangerous thing to cross that line from preparation that's faith-filled, God-appointed, to anxiety that is trying to get tomorrow into today and control it and feel the resources to be adequate for it on Wednesday. It's real dangerous. It can happen another way. Um, Not just how will it go on Sunday, but... uh, There's Maundy Thursday coming, and there's Easter coming, and there's April coming, and there's May coming, and there's June coming, and there's July coming, and then there's August coming. And if I have not learned the sweet lesson that I'm dwelling on these days, that worship for July 10... And strength to plan it will be given on July 5th and not before. No matter how much energy I expend trying to imagine where the energy is going to come from, it is not today's trouble. And it is faithless to try to feel it today. Today's mercies for today's burden. Tomorrow's mercies will be there for tomorrow. And one of today's mercies is the mercy to believe that mercy will be there tomorrow.
but not to feel that power today. Now, let me show you the second text. The first text was Matthew 6, 34. The second text is Lamentations 3, 22, from which we get the hymn, Great is Thy Faithfulness. And this text is the text from which I get this tremendous confidence that while each day has its appointed measure of pain and pleasure, it also has its perfectly appointed measure of mercy to sustain us. Let me read it for you. Lamentations 3.22. The Lord's loving kindnesses indeed never cease, for his compassions never fail. Here it is. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. Now just think on that with me. Why does he say that? New. What's wrong with the old mercy? I liked yesterday's mercy. I like the anointing I had two weeks ago in Oakdale at the missions conference. I like that mercy. It's not today's mercy. It's not tomorrow's mercy. Every day, this text says, gets new mercies. Which means, I love to put these two texts now beside each other. Okay? Matthew 6, 34. Don't be anxious about tomorrow. It'll be anxious for itself. Sufficient. Enough. Trouble will be there tomorrow for that day according to our Father's wise bestowment. And here is the assurance. The mercies will be new every morning. Every morning. Which means my inveterate tendency to have to feel today the resources to live tomorrow... Is a bad tendency. It's an unbelieving tendency. Because what God wants me to experience today is faith. Okay? And you know, as I've tried to think this through and experience it, there is a difference between faith laying hold on the promise that tomorrow's mercies will be sufficient and the experience of those mercies themselves in their sufficiency. I need to point that out because faith is a precious thing. It is a mercy. When God grants you, suppose your 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 gauge is over on empty, just touching the red as you're going to bed, and on the way to bed, you bump your head on the closet door, split your forehead open, and it drops below empty. Now at that point, if you have to get a stitch and come home. I did this one time. That's why it came to my mind. <laughs> we have this closet door in the hallway. It's open like this. I always go to bed in the dark. Noel's in bed if I'm prepared. I just boom, right into that thing. Come home and you say, mm, if, you, if you put one more straw on this camel's back, Lord, it's going to just like that. I don't think the Lord likes that attitude. The right attitude is, uh, I don't have any more resources. And so on my way to bed here, I have no idea how I'm going to get out of bed in the morning. Let alone do this or that. And God says, fine. Fine. Tomorrow's mercies are not coming tonight. But what I do want from you is, do you believe Lamentations 3.23? The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new tomorrow morning. They're new tomorrow morning. He wants faith from us as we bow in emptiness before him. Every day the Lord himself is near me with a special mercy for each hour. This is a great song. A special mercy for each hour. This truth will save you again and again and again from being crushed by trying to get tomorrow's burdens taken care of today and trying to say, will I be adequate? Can I feel adequacy? Oh, Lord, make me strong now for tomorrow's burdens. It isn't going to happen. Let me give you an illustration now. 
two weeks ago, the Sunday where the staff came back from their retreat. We were preparing to read that paper that, you know, on Sunday night. And uh, that afternoon, of all afternoons, between preaching in the morning and between reading that paper in the evening, I had to go preach at a, uh, a missions conference over in East St. Paul for the North American Baptists. I was driving over there about 3.30, supposed to preach at 4 o'clock, get back here by 6, and uh, my meter was below empty, it's below empty, below the red. I thought, good, we'll just run off the road here into a ditch. That'll be a, a great place to spend the afternoon and the evening. Well, instead, I just asked for faith. Because I, it wasn't getting the resources. You know, I was thinking, Come, give me the resources so I can do this thing. I just said, Lord, help me trust you that with a special mercy for each hour. Sometimes he does it hour by hour and not just day by day. So I got there and they were bustling and hustling and, and there wasn't any prayer. I said, where's this nice little quiet room where we can gather our thoughts and ask for the blessing? And it didn't happen. So we walk in there. Uh, after just a brief little word of prayer, standing up in the hall afterwards, and uh, I sit down, and, and there's the music, and I'm still on empty. I've got my thing, but I'm on empty. And uh, I stood up to the pulpit and uh, did all I know to do when I'm on empty, and I just said, let's pray. And I just asked God to come and to do what needed to be done, because here were 150 people or so who had come on a Sunday afternoon for something from the Lord. And I opened my eyes, and for ten minutes, I didn't look down at my, my papers. I never do that. For ten minutes. About my burden for the world. And when I was done and driving home, I was just so full of thanks to the Lord. And you all had experiences like that. He'll push you right up to the eleventh hour, and you wonder where in the world the resources are going to come from, and they come when the burden comes, and often not before. Tomorrow's mercies for tomorrow's burdens, today's mercies for today's burdens. Let me close with this story. I got it from Elizabeth Elliott's newsletter this week. In China, in 1931... There was a man named John Vinson, a missionary, American missionary. And uh, he was ministering in a little village. And an army of bandits, marauding group, swooped down on the village and uh, took him and 150 villagers, children, men, women, captive, head them into the hills. The soldiers in the army of, uh, got word of it and they started pursuing, trying to rescue them. That night knowing they had a choice prisoner in John Vinson, they said, uh, we'll let you go if you will uh, take a letter to the commanding officer of the Chinese forces and tell them to back off and leave us alone. So he had his freedom in his pocket for a letter, his life. And he asked them, will you let the 150 Chinese go with me? And they said, certainly not. And he said, well, then I'm not going to leave. And that night, uh, the bandits tried to escape. And there was a lot of gunfire and a lot of people were killed, bandits and people. And uh, John Vinson had just had a surgery and he couldn't run, couldn't break away. And a little Chinese girl reported later that she had seen uh, one of the bandits put a gun to his head and say, I'm going to shoot you. Aren't you afraid? Let me just stop the story right there for a minute. If you're like me, when you hear a story like this, you, you really start to get into it, and you put yourself in the position of a John Vinson, and you try to feel whether you would have the resources to do that, to say, no, I'm not leaving. And then to have the gun pointed at your head and wonder, what would I say? And you know what we generally experience when we ask that question? Guilt. Real simple reason. 
That's not today's burden for you. Dying for most of you is not today's burden. And therefore, you don't have a mercy to die today. You have a mercy to sit there and listen to me and to pray and ask God for the faith that when the time comes to die, the mercy will be there. That's what God wants from you right now. He doesn't care whether you feel real resourceful right now about a gun pointed to your head and could I stand firm and would I forsake the faith and would I try to knock the gun down and would I shoot the guy instead. He, that, is not what God's, that is not what God's looking for. God is looking right now into your heart for faith based on a promise in this Bible. The mercies will be new every morning. The day will have its perfectly appointed number of troubles. One of them might be death. You might be given a brief time to contemplate your dying. And if you are, the mercy will be there to die. Um, what John Vinson said in response to that question was, no, I'm not afraid. Because I will go straight to God. And he did. And there was a poem that was written, and I didn't bring it along, but I'll read it to you sometime in response to that about fear, which was very great. Let me just plead with you as we close now to not give in to my and your tendency to need to feel the resources emotionally, spiritually, physically today for what you know may come tomorrow. Let tomorrow's troubles be for tomorrow. Believe on the basis of God's word that when they come, the spirit will come and the mercy will come and the strength will come and the resources will come and you'll get through. So I'm looking out. I'm seeing ones of you out there that I know have big, heavy things in front of you. Surgeries, marital problems, job searches. And uh, I just want to, I want you to enjoy this truth. Mm. To learn the secret of not feeling adequate for this summer's problem. And that's okay. But to then just rest in the promise that you'll be adequate by his strength when it comes. Let's bow for prayer. We're going to sing now for about eight minutes. Try to just put the thought of any time out of your mind. These things that we've been talking about are so glorious. They are so rich. And these songs that we're about to sing simply give you a chance to lift your heart up to the Lord to declare to him and to the angel hosts and to the demonic principalities and powers and to each other that you believe these things and, and a chance to appropriate them in expression to him how valuable they are. So let's sing together from our worship folder. Lord, if the hymn writers can see it and can write about it so movingly, he whose heart is kind beyond all measure gives unto each day what he deems best lovingly its part of pain and pleasure. Every joy and trial comes down from above, traced upon our dial, our sundial for each day by the Son of Love. If the hymn writers can see it and say it and we can sing it, then, Lord, we can live it. And so I pray that to every saint in this room, you would grant the power to live it. Trusting you, that's all for us to do. Tomorrow's troubles will be sustained by tomorrow's mercies. And, Lord, if there are any in this room right now who haven't even gotten to first base in putting their faith in Jesus Christ, the King of glory, I just pray that they'd come and pray with a prayer team and put that behind them and walk with the king. And all the people said, 
Amen. Thank you for listening to this message by John Piper, pastor for preaching at Bethlehem Baptist Church in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Feel free to make copies of this message to give to others, but please do not charge for those copies or alter the content in any way without permission. We invite you to visit Desiring God online at www.desiringgod.org. There you'll find hundreds of sermons, articles, radio broadcasts, and much more, all available to you at no charge. Our online store carries all of Pastor John's books, audio, and video resources. You can also stay up to date on what's new at Desiring God. Again, our website is www.desiringgod.org. Or call us toll-free at 1-888-346-4700. Our mailing address is Desiring God, 2601 East Franklin Avenue, Minneapolis, Minnesota, 55406. Desiring God exists to help you make God your treasure because God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in Him.